You know, these are 17 year olds that have 10 times more passion than Palestinians, my generation or the generation before. You can't actually erase the people. The issue here is not Hamas rockets. The issue here is the siege, the occupation. So what's so painful and disturbing about what's happening there? It's being done in my name. When I say my name is in Israel, claims to speak for all Jews. I'd like to welcome everybody here to this latest episode of The Green Left Show. Uh, my name is Alex Bainbridge. Today we're going to be discussing the issue of freedom for Palestine. This comes in the context of Israel's latest assault against the people of Gaza and also East Jerusalem, and in fact across the entirety of occupied Palestine. This latest assault, not dissimilar to others in the past, has been characterised by deliberate targeting of residential buildings, doctors and medical facilities, media organisations, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is yet another shameful chapter of the Zionist project of genocide, attempted genocide and colonialism. And personally, I was very proud to be supporting the rallies that we held last week for the Nakba. There's more rallies coming up this, this coming weekend, and I would especially like to encourage everybody who's watching this, if you're, having, if you're watching this before the rallies take place, please get along to, uh, to join in the protest movement because people power can make a difference. Now, I'm joined today by three very special guests, and before I introduce them, I just want to acknowledge that we in Australia also are living in a, the midst of a colonial genocidal project. Um, we're living in stolen land. This is land where sovereignty was never ceded by Aboriginal people. And we pledge our ongoing commitment to campaigns and struggles to actually reverse that colonialism and try to rectify the injustices of the past. We've got three speakers here today. I'm especially pleased to welcome Rehab Charita. She is the daughter of Palestinian refugees. Thank you. I hope, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Also with us today, I'm especially pleased to welcome Anthony Lowenstein, who is an independent journalist and author. Pleasure. Also joining us is Abe Kadan from Partners for Peace. Welcome, Abe. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and being in your uh, medium here. Before we get started, I do want to uh, just say at the outset that if you'd like the work that we do, please become a supporter of Green Left. It is actually the most important way that you can support our project. And please help to build the audience for this Green Left show by sharing the link to this video or this podcast, however you're getting this, uh, however you're getting this episode, and give it a thumbs up, share the work, and yeah, if you can become a supporter, we would definitely very much appreciate it. I want to begin with the very last comment that Rehab Charita made when I interviewed her and I asked her if she had any further comments. So please take it away, Rehab. Just to say that this is a historic moment. Um, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope. And I think that regardless of the events that unfold in the coming weeks, regardless of what happens, something has been unleashed. And that ain't going anywhere. That ain't going anywhere. I mean, Israelis are rightfully afraid. And I say that not because, you know, I think that they should be afraid, but I think that the Israeli, you know, Franz Fanon talks about this in The Wretched of the Earth. The settler is only interested in living in a, in, in a settler colonial context. Once you remove that context, they're no longer interested. You know, we are demanding freedom and we are demanding equality. And that has been, and there's a united call for that. And I think that's the most important thing to note about this time that we are in. It's a historic moment. It's a very pivotal moment. And, and we are full of hope and full of support for the resistance. I began by asking Rehab and Abe their reactions to this latest assault. Look, it is horrifying. It is sad, frustrating, anger, all of those feelings really brings to the fore. Not because this is something having new, it's been happening for 15 years. And the incubation has been there for 54 years. Israel always says, this time we're going to demolish Hamas. This time we're going to demolish the infrastructure, this time. And yet three, four years later, we're back on the same spot. Nothing has changed. Israel using the same strategy, expecting different results. This is not going to happen. The issue here is not Hamas rockets. 
The issue here is the siege, the occupation. It, the occupation in itself is a daily violence against the Palestinians. The, the siege of Gaza, the blockade of Gaza, is a daily violation, it's a daily violence against the Gazan people. And they're saying, we have this issue to stop Hamas getting weapons. Hamas is getting weapons. So the policy of siege, the blockade, has failed and failed miserably. Who is suffering? The Gazan people. The Gazan people are only, not only suffering the siege, but they are suffering the killing and the murder daily. The destruction of their property, the destruction of their infrastructure, they don't have normality. Israel is saying we're not occupying Gaza. Gaza is occupied by Israel because nobody gets in or out without an Israeli permit. The, the Gaza using the shekel, which is the Israeli currency. They're not free. They are occupied. No rockets from, from the West Bank, and the West Bank is still under occupation. The, this this uh, uh, justification has, has so many holes. You cannot really justify it. Well, I think that um, this assault is like uh, all the previous assaults in that Israel is ruthless in terms of, you know, it's targeting um, media buildings. It's, it, it, you know, it, it bombed a street, the streets that lead up to Shifa Hospital, which basically house medical staff and doctors. So top neurologists, you know, the, the, the head of the, the, the um, Gaza coronavirus uh, response unit, the head of that, he was killed in the latest, you know, um, bombardment. So it's not any different as far as the colonial violence that Gaza has endured for decades. Um, that's not any different. What's different this time around is the international response. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, why, why the international response is as strong as it is now. Um, and also the language is much more, it's, it's really about the core issues, which is settler colonialism. And Palestinians in one voice, from Gaza to Haifa to Akka to Lud to Jenin to Sheikh Jarrah to the exile to the refugee camps in Lebanon, um, are in one voice saying, we have endured decades of violent settler colonialism. The reason why Sheikh Jarrah is so triggering for us as Palestinians is because for most of us, that's how our parents or grandparents were forced out of our homes and villages. So when we watch this, it's like we've, we've had to watch this over and over again. So the one thing it has done is united Palestinians. Israel has tried to play this game of, of separating, creating these kind of, not divisions, but just separating Palestinians by, Palestinians in a way have different grievances because they have different political statuses. That's the colonial game that Israel has played. And so Palestinians inside 48, uh, you know, inside so-called Israeli borders have a particular political status and a particular apartheid treatment. Palestinians in Gaza, again, different in the West Bank and outside of Palestine. Uh, obviously, we don't have access to our land. So that's our, you know, colonial, um, that's the experience of Palestinians outside. But what this has done is brought Palestinians together. It's unleashed, I believe, decades of rage, of accumulated rage, because we have had to watch Gaza get bombarded over and over again. How many times can a place be bombarded in the way that it is now? It's, it's painful. It's painful to look at. And so this accumulative rage, this accumulative anger, you know, with what we've had to endure has basically created this unified call for an end to settler colonialism. You know, you, usually in these kinds of situations as activists, as Palestinian activists, we get caught up in the detail, we, you know, we're trying to put reports out that show how many house evictions, they're not evictions, it's ethnic cleansing, but, you know, how many house demolitions have been in the last year. This time around, it's about really bringing it back to the core issues because enough is enough. Isra the Israeli colonial war machine has been unrelenting, unrelenting, you know, in its destruction of Palestinian life. And, 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 and basically making life impossible for Palestinians to live in Palestine in peace, in any part of Palestine. 
in peace. And so what we're seeing is this decades long, you know, a response to this decades long injustice. In, in one sense, there's a continuity with Israel's assaults of the past. In another sense, there are some aspects of this that are unprecedented. Yes, there was a general strike throughout Palestine. This is huge. The significance of this is huge, and I'll explain why. You know, we've got, as I said, the political status of Palestinians inside Palestine, outside of Palestine, has been different. Um, and basically, I mean, Palestinians inside Lids, for example. Lids is an area in, inside 48 Palestine, you know, inside the so-called borders of Israel. Um, there was a general strike, I say, that included uh, Lids. I'm, I'm, I was actually just in the middle of cutting a video about the general strike, which we're going to put out later today. I'll send you the link. Um, it's photographs of all the different areas. This hasn't happened since 1936, the 1936 uprising. For a little bit of context about the, the, the uprising in 1936, which my grandfather, I'm proud to say, took part in. He took part in the resistance and the uprising against British colonial plans for Palestine and in the general strike. So I felt like my presence at the protest here in Beirut yesterday, which was to support the general strike, was a continuation you know, of his efforts and, and, and proof that Israel has not succeeded. <laughs> Israel has not succeeded in, in, in beating our people into submission. That has been actually the Israeli policy. You know, we have friends that were in the Israeli army and they left because they saw it for what it was. And they, they tell us that they are trained to basically beat Palestinians into submission. What we are seeing now is that all of the Israeli tactics to do that haven't succeeded. The general strike yesterday, which brought Palestinians together for the first time since 1936, in a way that's, that, as I said before, bringing it back to the core issues of settler colonialism. This is not about problematic Israeli policy. This is about the nature of Israel. And every single Israeli policy is not an isolate, can't be treated as an isolated issue. The apartheid wall that it built in the West Bank, the, the bombardments of Gaza, the second-class citizenship and discrimination of Palestinians inside 48 Palestine, you know, the bantistanization of the West Bank, the forced exile, the cruelty of forced exile of Palestinians from outside to even touch their ancestral villages. All of these things, you know, have basically, um, you know, they haven't worked anyway. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. The Palestinian struggle is in full force. Israel is losing right now. With every bomb that it drops, it's losing. We are elated, but on the other hand, grief-stricken. Grief-stricken by having to watch these children and these innocent people. And, and that includes resistance fighters. You know, they are also innocent because they have the right to resist. You know, it's not as though... The, the targeting of militias in Gaza is even justified. These are an occupied people. So including the fighters, they're an occupied people who are resisting occupation. And under international law, that right is enshrined and, and understandably so, understandably so. It's occupation that is illegal. You know, we know this, we're past this. But so, sorry, I think I've lost my track um, train of thought. But it, it, is, it, is, it is, there is a lot of hope right now um there's you know the, the the palestinians sorry before we go on to the next point i just want to say you know we have felt um deflated for so many reasons there's been a culture of normalization in the arab world you know israel recently signed a normalization deals with the emirates and and and, and even in lebanon it's not public it's not really a public no one's making a song and dance about it but the lebanese government is in talks with israel negotiating about drilling in the water the, the shared, so-called shared water border. Um, so there's this been a climate of normalization. Um, it's been very depressing because the Palestinian resistance and the Palestinian movement has been, you know, like, I wouldn't say dead, it never died, but, you know, it, ha it hadn't, it really wasn't um, able to express itself. There was no, you know, but the forces, sometimes historical forces, just like the George Floyd moment that we saw recently, it's not as though George Floyd's murder was any more unjust than the murder of anybody that was killed by police brutality. But the certain historical forces that come together sometimes, you know, for African-Americans to have to watch their people over and over and over again 
you know, get targeted, it creates this rage. And when the moment's right, there, there's an uprising that actually creates change. And I think that's what we're seeing. This is, you know, this is one of those moments that's happening in Palestine at the moment. And, and there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope because Israel has never had a moral leg to stand on, but it's increasingly becoming difficult for Israel to justify, um, you know, to justify what it's doing, basically. And I want to turn now to Anthony Lowenstein. I asked Anthony about his experience of apartheid in Israel-Palestine. Look, I was based in East Jerusalem between 2016 and 2020, and East Jerusalem is under occupation by Israel, has been since 1967, so over 50 years. And I've been visiting Israel-Palestine since 2005, Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. And I guess when people often hear the term apartheid, maybe for the viewers of this, it'll be more normal or accepted, so to speak. But obviously for many others, it's, it's a bit of a new term to hear. We think of apartheid when we think of you know, South Africa back in the day. I would actually argue that South Africa still is under apartheid, but a different form of apartheid, but putting that in a conversation for another day, that what it means is that Palestinians are treated as second-class citizens. It means that in the West Bank or Gaza, which there's 5 million Palestinians, they don't have equal rights. In fact, they have no rights. They can't vote in Israeli elections. They are treated by a, a brutal military Israeli regime. Children are arrested, routinely attacked, tortured. Um, in Gaza, which is currently under attack by the Israeli Air Force, there are roughly 2.1 million Palestinians trapped in the world's biggest open-air prison. And what that means is that it's densely populated. People can't run away. So when, for example, there's an Israeli airstrike, people have nowhere to go. There's, you can't run away. I mean, you can leave your building, you could leave your apartment, but there's nowhere to go. And as we've seen in the last week or so, where Israel has killed now over 200 people, of which I think 50 or so were children. I don't know the exact figure right in a second, but it's a sizable proportion of children. That these are often families who are trapped in a home who can't go anywhere, who have nothing to do with Hamas, have nothing to do with terrorism, have nothing to do with anything apart from living their lives. And what apartheid means in the current Israeli-Palestine conflict is a system of dual rights where Jews are um, at the top of the hierarchy. And I speak as someone who's Jewish and I live there as a Jew. I'm not an Israeli citizen, just to put that very clearly on the record, but I am Jewish. So the discrimination when I was there was never against me. But what's so painful and disturbing about what's happening there, it's being done in my name. When I say my name is in Israel, claims to speak for all Jews. And although growing numbers of Jews say that's not the case, that they do not accept that thinking, the sad reality is, as we see in the last week, as much as I don't want to acknowledge this, the truth is that the majority of mainstream Jewish opinion supports Israel uncritically. It is changing. It is changing. Uh, but apartheid is a brutal reality. And just finally on this point, Human Rights Watch, probably the world's largest human rights organisation with its own political problems, which I won't get into right now, and some other um, issues around the world, not least in Latin and South America, often is very much towed a pro-US State Department line. But again, putting that issue aside for another day, it released a report about a month ago, uh, which was quite an important report because Human Rights Watch, with all its faults, is regarded quite seriously by a lot of people around the world, essentially saying that Israel's committing apartheid. Israel's leading human rights organization, B'Tselem, in January released a report saying exactly the same thing, not just in Israel, not just in the West Bank and Gaza, but saying that the entire territory controlled by Israel is apartheid. Of course, Palestinians have been arguing this for many, many years, and certain dissident Jews and Israelis. But I think you're seeing the impact of that just in the last week, although obviously US President Biden is 110% backing Israel, which is not surprising if you know his history. There is certainly what I see as a welcome, I think split is too strong a word, but there is a growing um, group of relatively small number, but growing of democratic politicians, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, AOC. AOC has her own slightly mixed history on this issue, but in general, they are getting far more vocal. They're talking about apartheid. They are talking about stopping this war. They're talking about stopping or curtailing U.S. military aid to Israel. Uh, 
so far it's had no policy impact and I think it probably won't in the short term. But what I think you're seeing is that an important split. There needs to be a split. I mean, on one level, I shall, I'll end with that. So, yes. <laughs> and Abe, your comments about apartheid? Well, you cannot have a Jewish state with a democracy. There are Christians there. There are Muslims. There are non, uh, non-religious people there. But the privilege is only for Jews and Jews alone, because this is a Jewish state. That's what they label it. That's what they call it. And if this is not apartheid, I don't know what is apartheid then. We had it in South Africa. They, they always denied apartheid when it was a glaring in, right to the world. It is apartheid because there are not two systems, three systems, the same thing in Israel where we have not only one system. We have, the Palestinians are ruled by Ottoman laws that 100 years old, by the British colonial laws. They are ruled by the military laws. They are not ruled by civil, the Israeli civil laws. And if this is not about that, if they have, someone have the same crime, an Israeli Jew and a Palestinian Israeli, they are different, they are treated differently. Jerusalem people, Palestinian in Jerusalem, they are treated differently. Their homes demolished, their homes are taken away from them. They're not having a citizenship. They don't have the right. They pay more taxes. Clearly, it's not enough just to analyze what is happening in the area. We need to work out what is to be done. And so I asked, uh, first of all, Anthony, can you please comment on on what the Australian government should be doing. Yes, I can. Let me just briefly say what the government is not doing now. <laughs> the government, and this is obviously under, you know, Scott Morrison, but let's be under no illusion. If Bill, if Bill um, Shorten had won the last election, there would be little difference. Yes, in the Labor Party, there is some movement, which I welcome, of trying to change this conversation. You don't really see much evidence of it at the top levels the Penny Wongs, the Tanya Plibersex, the um, Anthony Albanese views, you do see some, um, well, Bob Carr has become a really curious figure, actually. Bob Carr for years, who was the Premier of New South Wales, who's hardly a left-wing radical, let's be honest. I mean, New South Wales, he was a pretty terrible Premier, in my view. He's sort of become quite a weirdly interesting character in the ALP in the last years on this issue, quite outspoken on Palestine, talks about apartheid, is pushing that party left. Not fast enough, and let's not get into detail about that, but there is something happening in the ALP, which I support. I don't support the ALP at all. But I think it's important that that conversation is happening and if they'd won, if Bill Shorten was Prime Minister, there probably would be a little bit more within the Labor Party to put pressure on Shorten as Prime Minister. However, he's not Prime Minister, which is probably not a bad thing anyway. The current Australian government's position is uncritical towards Israel, do whatever you want, um, it, uh, Australia is, has made public statements that they block any um, ICC investigations into Israel at all. Most people might not be aware that whenever there's a UN vote on Israel-Palestine, this has been the case for years, there is most of the world on one side. And on the other side is Israel, the US, Australia, and some client states in the Pacific, you know, Micronesia, Palau. Now, obviously, they're doing it, those countries, because they're US client states. So I guess I kind of get that in a way because they need the money. And OK, fair enough, I guess. But what's Australia's excuse? <laughs> um, I mean, we kind of know in a way. But look, Australia's role could be very significant. Um, it's not going to change the conflict on its own. We're a relatively small power. But what we could do is a few things, briefly. We could sever all military ties with Israel. Um, Australia has a long history of both buying and using Australian weapons and vice versa. That's a problem. That could stop. There could be a um, a complete uh, well. Well, that's that. That'd be a start. The second thing is Australia could be far far more outspoken against what's going on. They could be critical of the idea that Australia, as role is a small one, that we could be very critical of what's going on there. We could um, be far more outspoken about Israeli, sorry, Australian Jewish citizens going to fight for Israel. I don't know if there are any particular Aussie Israelis fighting right now in this current conflict that I don't know, but in their past there has been, in fact, including in Gaza. And I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I can't think of many other examples where an Australian citizen can go and fight 
in another country's war, potentially commit war crimes, and it's just seen as business as usual. I mean, can you imagine if an Australian went to go and fight for Hezbollah? Well, clearly that would be against the law here, and Australia would not tolerate that, or ISIS. Now, I'm not saying that Israel is ISIS, but I'm saying that I can't think of any other example where this is happening. So Australia could be far more outspoken against that and say this is not acceptable. Um, and I think Australia could, if, as, a, as, a, as a medium power, also um, be far more supportive of boycotts. Now, it's hard to see that happening anytime soon, but I do compare it to apartheid South Africa, where there was a gradual global campaign by many countries uh, not led, I might add, by Australia or the US. In fact, um, the US was one of the last countries to come on board because successive US presidents supported what was happening in South Africa. But a sporting boycott. Um, there's a range of things Australia could do. And I think like with most things, we'll be followers rather than leaders, but it's certainly possible. But our role at the moment is deep complicity. And now we'll turn to Abe. Your comments on what the Australian government should be doing at the moment. Would live to its values and principles without having a double standards. There's one standard for this and stand for other. If you are for human rights, if you are for democracy, if you are for freedom, then support the Palestinian to have two state solution as per the official policy. The Australian government knows two state solution is becoming further and further away. It's more impossible today than yesterday. And it's not going to be any better. Supporting Israel, Israel will not give up one inch of the territory. And we're going to find this violence going on and on and on. And they, we are just watching it and supporting the aggressor. And we have? Well, I guess the colonial context in Australia, for me, it's like all is in order. You know, Scott Morrison is supporting Israel. All is in order. It makes sense. Everything is falling into place. You know, the fascist leaders of the world are coming together. Um, you know, the leader of Brazil, Trump, um, you know, Scott Morrison, you know, birds of the same feather will flock together. And so for me, it's, it's, it makes sense that Scott Morrison supports Israel. When you think about all of his other policies, it would be strange <laughs> if he supported the Palestinian resistance, given his policies on everything else. And most importantly, when we talk about Australia, we talk about the occupation there. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a different kind of brutality and it's a different kind of, you know, colonial brutality, but it's been unabated in Australia as well, you know, in, 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 in a different way. And so, I mean, of course, we, we, we want to reach a point where governments are cutting ties with Israel. It's going to become difficult even for the Scott Morrisons of the world, for the ScoMos of the world, to justify their support for Israel. That's what we're, we're not counting on his moral enlightenment. You know, I mean, sorry, that's a term, but we're not relying on him to wake up and suddenly realise, you know, it, that's not going to happen, but the pressure could lead to that. You know, in America, you, you've got a, a president at the moment who, like every president before him, has been very one-sided in his support for Israel and Israel's right to defend itself, no mention of the destruction it's causing, no mention of all of it. And for the first time that we can, I mean, remember that for the first time, he's actually getting pressure. He's actually under a lot of pressure because he's only supporting Israel. So it's not as though Joe Biden, he's an ardent Zionist. It's not as though he will reach the point of having to concede or having to, you know, because through his own, you know, um, position, but he will be forced to because of public pressure. And so that's what I hope for in Australia as well. I hope that the pressure is such that he has no choice. I mean, Israel is a rogue, like it's, it's basically a fringe fascist colonial war machine, you know, and there's very few, unfortunately they're powerful, but there's very few governments and powers in the world that support Israel. Our job, I think, is to make it difficult even for them. Well, I guess like that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, I've got a vision where the Australian government will boycott and cut diplomatic relations with Israel. And that may seem far-fetched far at the moment. It might seem far off. But I believe it is possible with people power to bring that kind of pressure even to the Scott Morrisons of the world.
And um, I guess, do you agree that that's what we should be pushing for? That's my question. I absolutely agree. I think the pressure should be on. I think the pressure should be on to justify their support for Israel, to really show them up, to really show them up. Because if you are supporting this now, I don't, I mean, what we were talking about in the beginning, it's, it's, it's actually become, when I say it's about settler colonialism now, it's clearer than it's ever been before, you know, what, what this is about. It's not a religious conflict. It's not this. It's not that. It's, so it's violent settler colonialism, and and the just the, the 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 people we used to I mean people in 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 positions of power used to ha- were on the back foot if they wanted to support Palestine, they would get a backlash and they were on the back foot. That's changed. That's already changed. You know, we just need that to reach the furthest points, which are these other colonial kind of fascistic governments, like um, you know, in the states and. Uh, in Australia. I also asked about the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign. This has been one of the most important tactics for the Palestine solidarity movement around the world. We, we need to be selective in what we buy and what we don't. There is uh, ethical investment. Ethical investment is about not supporting women industry, not supporting the environment that damage the environment, We're not supporting anything that uh, against the human rights Israel is doing just that, violating human rights in breach of the international law. It is an occupying power, and it has been for 54 years. It's denying me as a Palestinian of a home. It is really, and I think, boycotting the products of the Israeli settlements is the least we can do to register our this disapproval of this policy. All what we want is to live side by side in peace and harmony, in two-state solution, and not talk about this right now, now or forever. We're going to talk about it the next year. We're going to talk about the year after because nothing will change while Israel getting away with murder. And, I mean, the final question I wanted to ask, I mean, the boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign has been the main tactic that the Palestinian Solidarity Movement has been pursuing in recent years. Do you agree that's what we should continue to do or do you think there are other things that are more pressing? I think um, by all means necessary, basically. By all means necessary. And, and I don't, I don't favour one form of resistance over the other. Each form of resistance has its place. I don't get into debates about which I get. I mean, I think it's it's just about where we stand. From the outside, BDS is a, is a great weapon, you know, in our hands. Um, and I think that it's really important for people to, um, you know, it's it, you know, we we can basically show our support uh, in different ways. And I think BDS is a very effective way. It worked for South Africa, and I don't see why it won't work for Palestine. And uh, Anthony has been speaking out recently about the issue of journalists and media, how they cover this, both this current assault and also the issue of Palestine and Israel more broadly. Can you comment on that for us, say, please, Anthony? So many journalists, and obviously one doesn't want to generalise every single journalist, but many journalists do a really terribly um, complicit job. And what I mean by that is that they are happily, happy to republish uncritically Israeli government PR. And yes, it's tricky when, for example, right now there are no Western journalists in Gaza, but there are lots of Palestinian journalists in Gaza who are doing remarkably important work, either filing for Western news organisations or on social media or whatever it may be. And I, with a number of other journalists last week, wrote a statement. We're all in Australia. Um, People can find this at dobetteronpalestine.com. It was a statement that essentially said, and people can read the exact words, but essentially saying that it's no longer acceptable, and it never was, but it's even more unacceptable now that journalists do this kind of both sides argument, namely there's the Israeli side and Hamas, and they're both fighting, and who knows what's going on, and it's all very confusing and complicated. And, yes, there are two sides. On one level, that's factually true. There is Israel and there's Hamas. That's true. But this is not sort of two equal sides. There's an occupy and an occupied. I mean, I often think about would journalists, and some did, but, most didn't, in 1990, four years before the end of apartheid. If you look at how most Western media covered apartheid in South Africa, 
I'm not talking about some media who supported it till the end, but in general, by then, most media, with exceptions, accepted the fact that what was happening in South Africa was apartheid and horrible and should end. It wasn't sort of, well, the black South Africans are fighting back and the white South Africans are just doing their best in a very tough neighbourhood. What choice do they have? You know, you view, you know, you decide what's, what's right and what's wrong. It wasn't like that. It was clear that one side was hugely incorrect. It doesn't mean that the ANC, for example, was perfect or angels. No, it doesn't mean that the Palestinians are angels. They're not. There are horrible Palestinians doing horrible things as well. I mean, they're humans. So obviously, that's the case. But in general, this is a question of occupied and occupier. So the statement essentially was released on Friday last week, about a week ago, less than a week ago, and it kind of went viral, meaning that a lot of journalists have signed from across the media spectrum. Now, of course, what does that actually mean? Well, signing a statement, you could argue, is a quite simple thing to do, although in some media organisations we're hearing that they're getting in trouble by their bosses for doing so. Um, I'm not going to name names, obviously, but there has been some issues. But generally speaking, I've been pretty happy with the number of journalists who have signed on. The aim of that statement, just briefly, was to say that within your own media organisation, obviously I'm a freelancer, so I have no media organisation, but if you're with the ABC or The Guardian or whoever you may be with, or even um, Fairfax or News Limited, good luck with that. But whoever you're with, that it is important to have a conversation. It's not about blindly accepting everything a Palestinian says. No, it means saying that this is not two equal sides of a conflict. And test is now what happens in the coming months and years. Once this conflict, so to speak, is over, it'll end tomorrow, next week, God knows when, not soon enough, but it will end. And it'll go back to the awful status quo, as we all know. So the question is, how often are Palestinian voices lifted up? How often are they given a chance to be heard? And in general, more than 10 years ago, yes. And I started writing about this 15 years ago. And it's changed quite a lot since then and public opinion is reflected in that that in many western countries including the u.s which is arguably the most important country on this issue if the u.s wanted to end the occupation tomorrow it would be over by tonight and i'm slightly exaggerating but you know the u.s is in some ways the key country here yes other countries have influence of course they do australia's influence is minimal although i think could be we'll maybe talk about that but so the aim so i think a lot of media coverage here is quite poor the choice of words um this issue of clashes you know choosing how you describe a conflict this is an occupier and an occupied and that language i think is quite unfamiliar to the majority of journalists who probably are writing the way mainstream media works these days especially if you're based here you might do a story today about Woolworths or coles and tomorrow a story about israel palestine so to some extent I have a degree of sympathy for people who don't have to be experts on Israel-Palestine. I get that. But this has to come both from journalists and those higher up the food chain. There are senior editors at ABC and others who know enough, at least, about this conflict. And there needs to be a, a sense that there is a space to both humanise Palestinians who have been, frankly, demonised for decades and given a chance to be heard. And I think also that's finally... Alex, this sense that the media routinely, blindly interviews Israeli government spokespeople. Yes, there's a conflict going on, a war, call it whatever you want. And I'm not saying one ignores the Israeli side. Have on a government spokesperson if you really need to, but at least interrogate them. Don't simply have them on and ask them softball questions. I mean, they are literally bombing civilian areas, they're bombing media organisations, ask them tough questions, interrogate them. And too often that's not happening. So as usual, I'm pretty disappointed with the media coverage of this uh, current round of violence. And it could be a lot better. And uh, the fact that hundreds and hundreds of people have signed, including from large media organisations, including some quite prominent writers, not just um, journalists, but media commentators, intellectuals, does encourage me. But the test is what happens now, what happens next. And finally, I'm very pleased to be able to ask this question to Anthony about the question of anti-Semitism. Now, I think in the international uh, progressive movement, this has been a big issue in recent years. It was notably one of the main avenues of attack against the progressive Jeremy Corbyn leadership and the British Labour Party. 
but it's also been used against progressive people in other parts of the world and other contexts, including Australia. Uh, at the same time, there are the reality of the growth of the far-right forces around the world, some of whom do exhibit very blatant and explicit anti-Semitism as part of, their, part of their campaign. So I asked Anthony, first of all, about the reality of anti-Semitism today, and secondly, what advice he would give to people who have been falsely accused of anti-Semitism purely and simply because they support Palestinian rights. The weaponization of anti-Semitism is something that disturbs me. I've written about it uh, for a long time, and I saw it definitely around the attempt, frankly, the successful attempt to destroy Corbyn. I don't think Corbyn lost the election simply because of this issue, but it was a huge factor. And let's not forget, the forces that were arrayed against Corbyn were not just the usual suspects. They weren't just the Daily Mails and the right-wing press, though they were certainly on board too. It was also The Guardian, a key self-described progressive organisation who on some issues are moderate, progressive, call it whatever you want, they are. And on Israel-Palestine, some of their coverage actually is very good. But with the Corbyn issue, they were an absolute disgrace. And they played a key part in weaponizing anti-Semitism. I mean, this went on for five years. In the end, I think Corbyn was just destroyed by the fact that there were virtually no voices in support of him. There were lots of people on the streets who had been supportive of him. And one thing that I think one needs to push back on very hard is two things. One, yes, anti-Semitism is real. It's a problem. It's growing in parts of the world. We've seen even in the last week, a lot of examples in the, in Europe, in the US, in the UK, of blatant just Jew hatred, you know, people driving in Jewish neighbourhoods, shouting out, you know, anti-Semitic rhetoric. None of that is acceptable and no one who wants to be part of Palestinian solidarity should have anything to do with people like that, whether they're, whoever they are, par, you know, Palestinian, Arab, Muslim, whatever they are. That is simply, it's toxic. It's toxic. It's toxic. And it's wrong. Um, and just like we can't blame all Muslims for 9-11, it's sort of obvious to say that, you can't blame all Jews for what's happening in Israel. Having said that, clearly there needs to be a, both an acknowledgement that anti-Semitism is real, but also realising how it's weaponized against those who support Palestinian rights. And I see this more and more because it's actually on one level a very sadly destructive and effective weapon against someone. No one wants to be accused of anti-Semitism, rightly so, because it has a toxic history, not least in the 20th century, obviously before that too, but particularly in the last century with the uh, Nazi Holocaust. And I think there's also, there needs to be pushback against saying, you can be a supporter of Palestinian rights and be anti-Semite, yes, but anti-Zionism, for example, of which I'm one, I'm Jewish, but also an anti-Zionist, it's not anti-Semitism. Can you be an anti-Zionist and anti-Semite? Of course you can. But anti-Zionism is not inherently anti-Semitic, far from it. I think, in my view, all Jews, Palestinians, Christian, Muslims should live in a one-state reality in the Middle East. It, 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 religion, no religion, in my view, it would be a secular state. It's not, it's not for me to decide. It's for the people there to decide. My personal view would be secular, but I don't, you know, I don't get a say. Um, but I think there has been... I think it's still a very effective tool that's weaponized against those who will speak out for Palestinian rights. I hear it a lot. Even in the last week, I know a lot of people who've messaged me saying, we tiptoe carefully. These are not people who are anti-Semites. These are people who are, I don't know how they would describe themselves, left, progressive, uh, whatever. I don't know who they vote for, but this is in Australia and elsewhere. People tiptoe because they might say, I don't know enough about the issue, um, I don't feel fully informed. I don't want to be accused of anti-Semitism. And to me, when you weaponize it, you cheapen it and you therefore lessen the ability to fight against real anti-Semitism, which is happening, which is the attacking of synagogues and attacking of you know Orthodox Jews who are visibly Jewish. You know, obviously liberal Jews don't wear the all that traditional kind of black garb. And Orthodox Jews do. So they're kind of on, in some parts of the world, sadly, very obvious targets. And we've seen that attacks in quite a few Orthodox communities, particularly in New York in the last year. Horrible attacks against Jews just because they, in inverted commas, look Jewish. So therefore, they're, they're a target. But we have to push back against the weaponization of it because it's, it's dangerous. And I fear that as 
in the coming years and decade as Israeli actions inevitably become more extreme because to maintain what's happening there, which is basically ethno-nationalism on steroids, the only way that can be done is with more and more extremism and violence. And I think one of the things that I would like people to be aware of if they're not already is what's happened in Israel in the last 20 years is, I'm talking about the Israeli Jewish population here, there's been a real radicalization to the far right. And what that means is not every Israeli Jew is a fascist. Of course they're not. But there is, and I have Israeli friends, not, not that many, sadly, who share these views, who are deeply opposed to what's going on. They, they're active. But the Jewish Israeli left, for want of a better expression, is tiny. I often joke it's like 10 people in a room. It's probably more, it's more than that. But it's very small. They have no real presence in the Knesset, the parliament, really, of any note. And the danger is that we think mistakenly that by Netanyahu losing office in a week or a month, that the replacements are going to be better. The truth is that on the issue of the occupation, at least, they all pretty much think the same thing, they being those in the parliament there. And they believe in maintaining the occupation and deepening it. Yes, there are some differences. Netanyahu has brought in some far-right fascists into his coalition, which the others would not do. And that far-right fascism, as you've seen in the last week, of literally Jews marauding through towns, uh, committing pogroms against Arabs, is far more mainstream than people like to think. And what I mean by that is that there are a lot more people in Israel who support that kind of behaviour or the, or the values of that behaviour than we like to think. It's, not, it's easy to say it's just a few bad apples. It's not. It's a far more mainstream view. And we know that because you see in the last week, and most of this does not get translated or, or spread around the world. I don't speak Hebrew, but I know a lot of people who do and I get their material translated. There is almost complete uniformity across the Israeli political media. There are some exceptions, Haaretz, which is a liberal Jewish, liberal Zionist newspaper, actually, but I think it's probably, in fact, it's unquestionably the best Jewish Israeli newspaper that exists. And it has a, yes, editorially it has quite a, uh, it's a liberal Zionist paper, but it has some good, really good reporting in there. And, uh, but putting that paper aside, because most of its audience is more international than actually within Israel, that there is a real bloodlust. There's no other word for it. I mean, literally a commentator saying, giving the IDF advice of how to bomb Gaza neighbourhoods more. I mean, this is the level that we're talking about. So when you have real anti-Semitism thriving in the world, I completely reject the idea that being critical of what's happening within Israel is anything to do with anti-Semitism. It's not. And I think more and more people need to speak out and say that. I would like to thank everybody for joining us here today on this latest episode of The Green Left Show. I'd like to especially thank all three of the speakers, Rehab, Anthony and Abe, who've given up their time to be with us today. And I would like to encourage you, if you like our work, please become a supporter of Green Left. It is the most important way that you can support our project. But you could also show support very simply by just sharing the link to this video, giving it a thumbs up, uh, writing a comment, uh, writing a review on Apple Podcasts. However you found this, uh, this podcast or this video, please share the link and help us to build our audience. And hope to see you at the rallies on the weekend. And we'll see you again soon.